Welcome home PCC, my name is Summer Levinson and I hope you have your pumpkin spice and your fuzzy hats ready because October is here. I don't care if it's still in the 70s, I'm not taking the scarf off. As much as I'm happy that fall is here, I'm even more happy that you are here. If you're new, let me be the first to say hey. We're stoked that you're joining us and I'd love to invite you to check out our website listed on the screen so that you can find out more about PCC. There's also a connection card that we'd love for you to fill out so we can say hi and find out more about you. And for those of you who just want to connect with PCC in some way, maybe get involved in serving or join a group or ask for prayer, a connection card would be perfect for that too. Text CONNECT to the number on your screen and we'll send you a connection card link and we look forward to hearing from you. Kids, we see you and we love you. Kids are a big deal to us because they are a big deal to Jesus. Every Sunday, your kids can access the Kid Bundle, which has Bible stories, songs, activity, you name it, it's there. Well, except if you name pizza. Uh, besides that, it's always a good time. You can get to the Kids Bundle by tapping Kids Resources on our webpage. Now, PCC, I'd love to pray over our time together before we head into worship so we can align our hearts and come just as we are to the Lord. Will you pray with me? <sighs> Father God, we just come before you, um, maybe not in the best of times, maybe our hearts are heavy this week. Um, maybe we're having a great week, but no matter where we are, we come to you just as we are, Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful for this community. Um, I'm thankful for your presence here in this body, in this church, in the body of Christ. Um, Lord, as we enter a time of worship, I pray that you will speak to our hearts and comfort us or bring us joy or remind us that you are with us always, Lord. In your name, I pray these things. Amen. Now let's worship together. Hey there, everyone. Today's a great day. We're in partnership. Peninsula Covenant Church and Redeemer Redwood City. We're in partnership today and we're going to be leading worship together. My friend Brandon's here and we're going to invite you just to adore and love on Jesus together. PCC, I do understand that you don't know this first song that we're going to do, but you're going to love it. Join in with us after you've heard it once or twice. Indeed, there is nothing that our God can't do. and you don't mind just put your hands together yeah Woo. lead us brother just one word but just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me and just one word the darkness has to retreat I'll sing just one touch just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name 
that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do Just one word Just one word You hear what's broken inside me Just one word And you revive every dream Yes you do Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. In just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name. That makes a way There's nothing that our God can do oh, There's nothing that our God can do There's not a prison wall He can break through Oh, praise a name That makes a way There's nothing that our God can do I believe I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise uh. let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus, I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that our God there's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall you can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing.
to sing this next verse. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus oh, come. Christ oh come to the altar the Father's arms are Come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Jesus. The blood that ransomed me. Thank you, Lord. I love how worship brings us together. Before our message, we have a few announcements for you all. So John Becker is one of my favorite humans and he is here to talk with us about house churches. We've been encouraging our PCC family to join one, especially if you're like me and really missing that in-person connection. John is going to explain what a PCC house church is and hopefully answer a lot of your questions. So here's John. Hi, I'm John Becker, and it's such a joy to share with you about House Churches and its relationship to PCC. Maureen and I have been uh, members of PCC for many years and global partners in, in mission. You know, House Church, the whole concept is really a biblical concept. The first time it's mentioned is in Acts 1 verse 13, where it's talking about Jesus and the disciples meeting in the upper room. That was a house church. And then again in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, uh, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth saying, I send greetings to the church that meets in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. 
And again, we, we read in Colossians where Paul's greeting the church that meets in the house of Nymphus, who is a, a wonderful woman who led that church. And so we in PCC have wanted to, to go right back to the early expression of the church. We see house churches all over the world, and actually part of our ministry is helping facilitate that, especially where people can't meet in public places or there's no official church buildings because the governments don't allow it. And so people are meeting house to house and family to family and the gospel is spreading so powerfully in the neighborhood. And so we at PCC, as we're in this COVID period where we can't gather in larger groups, we're wanting to bring uh, the gospel to the neighborhoods through our house churches. Now, what you'd experience in the house church is a small group of people meeting together and either watching online the streamed uh, service or watching it before and then coming and discussing the scriptures and application to our lives, praying together, worshiping together in a socially distant and safe environment. But that's what the experience is and it's incredible. We're hosting one in our home and what I can promise you is because we've taken church to our neighborhood, We've seen things happen that wouldn't have happened just up here on the hill in the bigger gathering. Neighbors that are engaged, people we've met at our local park that have taken part, and people that have even taken a, a real interest in the gospel as a result of being a part of a smaller community of people. And so we've started already nine house churches in the neighborhoods around Redwood City. And we're so excited those homes that have opened up and the leaders that are facilitating those. Right now we have about 150 people distributed about around those nine house churches and we're wanting to double that within the next couple of months. And so if you feel like you'd be like to be connected to either one of those house churches or would like to host or pair up with someone to co-host, we want to invite you, just visit our website, uh, wearepcc.com, and you'll find the information about house churches, how you can get involved, how you can po possibly volunteer. So I just want to encourage you to check it out. Don't miss out on what God's doing through us meeting house to house so that we can gather, grow, give and go together as a body. Thank you. Our mission at PCC is to empower generations to passionately follow Jesus one person at a time. That is our primary focus and where we believe God is calling us. That mission is made possible by you, our PCC community. I'd love to invite you to invest through PCC by texting the word GIVE to the number on your screen. Thank you for all the ways that you invest in the mission of PCC. Now let's hear from Hannah and one of our students reading today's scripture. Hello, PCC family. It's Hannah Nielsen here, middle school pastor uh, at PCC. And I'm here with my friend, Caroline Walker. She is in sixth grade at Synapse and her favorite hobby is hanging out with her friends. And Caroline is going to give us a little bit of information about the fruit of the spirit, joy. Hi, I'm Caroline. And um, for me to live out joy in my own life, looks like this little guy here named Chewy. And he brings me joy every single day because the first thing I think about when I wake up is um, is him and, um, and I snuggle with him every morning. And it just makes me super happy because he's so affectionate and it just brings me happiness. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Caroline, for sharing that. PCC, can you say the verse with me? Galatians 5, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Maybe this is your testimony. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. The 
moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Say it with us all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so goodness and mercy Amen. shall follow us all the days of our life. Amen.
Hey PCC, it's Gary. Welcome, welcome to all our people watching online, especially welcome to our house churches. Hey, real fast, speaking of house churches, we've got a great problem. We have more people that wanna be in a house church than we have house churches. So if you have a home that you would like to open up, I would ask every stakeholder, pray about this, please. And if God's given you the green light, email Scott Kirksey at Scott, uh, Scott K at wearepcc.com. All right, we're on this series on the fruit of the Spirit, week two. Let me bring you into an experience I had two weeks ago. Unbeknownst to me, in the middle of one of our heat waves and smoke storms, around 6 p.m., a huge oak tree across our street fell and pulled down a power line, and it cut off power to every house on the 100 block of Grand Street across the street. Now, I discovered this when I went for a walk around 10 p.m. I just saw all my neighbors across the street in their front yards in pitch darkness, sweating, complaining how their food was spoiling, how it was hotter in their house than outside, how they couldn't even shower. Their home was like a sauna. You know, as I walked down the block past the down power line and the utility workers fixing it, I thought, it's amazing how my neighbors and I can live across the street from each other and have a completely different experience. My evening was filled with laughter in an air-conditioned house, well lit, with ice cream. Theirs was anything but that. What was the difference? Our power lines. See, we were tapped into active power sources. They weren't. Do you know in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, that's our power source. So you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. That's another power source. Friends, the offer on the table, if you will, is that in Christ, we can root our lives to the power of the Holy Spirit. He can electrocute us, as one PCC or told me, and produce supernatural, radiant lives. Those lives will create fruit in our lives. That's the brand of the Christian life. Last week, we looked at love. This week, we're looking at joy. Did you know that joy is a central theme in the Bible? And it's an evasive theme in our world, especially in 2020. You know, I just Googled books this, this week with the joy of in the title. Immediately, 90,000 results came up. There's a lot of people looking for joy out there. There's the joy of cooking, uh, the joy of painting by Bob Ross. The Joy of Mathematics was a book, clearly a work of fiction. <laughs> this book called Spark Joy by Marie Kondo. It was on simplicity. You remember this. She talks about holding up everything you own and asks, does this spark joy? And if it doesn't, get rid of it, which is why the Gadinis no longer have cats in their house. You know, the reality is something isn't working because even with 90,000 titles on joy, most people aren't feeling it. Man, no surprise here, because what God creates can be counterfeited. And the bar for so many is just happiness. That's the counterfeit to joy, and I get it, and I'm not even down on happiness. But given our COVID, racial, political, natural disaster year that we've lived through, it makes sense that happiness is evasive, because happiness is dependent on happenings. Our COVID moment has certainly exposed what I would call the fragility of happiness. As our freedoms, as our health, as our dollars, the stock market, our jobs, teenagers, uh, for you teenagers in, in your classrooms get taken away or your sports get taken away, for you extroverts, as your normal human connections get taken away, happiness evaporates and despair creeps in. Friends, happiness is deceptive, uh, even delusional. I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it's a good thing, but it can be deceptive. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25 says this, speaking of Moses, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy, and here it is, the fleeting pleasures of sin. But friends, this passage we're studying today was written, you need to know this, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, in and in, in to an oppressed people, so oppressed, times so oppressive, it makes our 2020 year look like a fairy tale. 
please hear me. Jesus isn't consumed with our happiness. It's not his end goal. His end goal is our holiness. And in holiness, there's something much richer, much deeper, much more enduring than what's dependent on circumstances. He wants to give us joy. That word is used a lot in our culture, so let me define joy. How would you define it? Here's mine. Here's the one we're gonna work with for the rest of this message. An internal experience of deep contentment and peace produced by the Holy Spirit and grown through a growing relationship and intimacy with Jesus. I want you to break up for a minute and ask this question. What has our COVID crisis revealed to you about your joy? What's robbed you of joy? Given our year, do you even believe that joy is accessible? Take 90 seconds and answer that question. Ready? Go. Friends, are you aware that God designed our walk with him to be characterized by joy? That's part of our brand, if you will, as followers of Jesus. Hey, come on a joy ride with me throughout the Bible. Let's do an overview of this topic. Let's start with God himself. Psalm 1611 says this, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Philosopher, theologian Dallas Willard said this in his book, Divine Conspiracy. We should, to begin with, think that God leads a very interesting life, that he's full of joy, and I love this. Undoubtedly, God is the most joyous being in the universe. <laughs> and God's joy is contagious. When John the Baptist was in utero, as Mary walked in the room with John the Baptist's mother with Jesus in utero, Elizabeth, John's mom, blurted out in Luke 1, 14, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Did you know that God actually demanded and commanded his people to party? That's why in the Hebrew scriptures, God commanded the Israelites to have seven different feasts a year. These were literal parties commanded for the Jewish people. And there actually was a time when Israel stopped their parties during an oppressive time. And God raised up this man named Nehemiah. We studied him a couple years ago. He quickly commanded the parties to be reinstated because as he said famously in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When Jesus was born in Luke 2.10, the angel announced, don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news that will cause great joy for all the people, all the people. Now think with me, what possible news could be good for all the people? We have no news on this planet that's good for all people. Even when we had the World Cup, someone doesn't like who wins. November 3rd, there's an election in America. Did you know that? <laughs> November 4th, that's not gonna be good news for some of the people. Even the royal wedding of Meghan Markle, Prince Harry, shown around the world. That wasn't good news for all people. Then before his death, 
In the context of grief, Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 11, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. Look at this. And that your joy may be what? Complete. The word means to be full, to contain as much as possible. This, my friends, is God's design for us through the Holy Spirit. And PCC, if this is such an emphasis throughout the Bible, why is it that so many Christ followers are so joy deficient? And when I say so many Christ followers, I mean me. My own experience, I've confessed to my men's group, I confessed to even to our staff. 2020, it's had glimpses of joy for me, but it's also exposed my happiness idol attachment. And it's exposed the fragility of it. And I've had to live a narrative in 2020 too much filled with anxiety and worry and sleepless night. Hence this series. I desperately need what we're talking about every week, but I desperately need it this week. Let's walk quickly and discover how do we recover joy. I want to give you three points. And the first two are from a book called Philippians. That book is just four chapters long, but joy is mentioned 17 times in the book. You can actually read the book of Philippians, I would encourage you to, in 20 minutes, which means basically every minute almost, Paul mentions joy. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul gives this audacious command. This is not a suggestion. He says, rejoice in the Lord, look at this word, always. And he says, I'll say it again, rejoice. Friends, I want you to know, someone taught me long ago, where God guides, God provides. God would not command us to be joy-filled if he didn't provide for us the way to access the power source for a joy-filled life. Here's the first point. How do we access joy? Reorient your thinking. Reorient your thinking. Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, my brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts. Circle that. We'll get to it in a minute on what is true and honorable, what is right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Let's go back to fix your thoughts. It's actually a play on words. It doesn't just mean, and it does, continually ponder and consider. Let this be the boundary for what you dwell on, okay? Set your mind on. But literally, Paul's talking about fix or repair your thoughts. In other words, he's saying, repair the way you've been thinking. You know, my daughter, fourth daughter, Bella, went to Cal Poly. She's there this fall. And when she moved into the dorms, they gave her a packing list, not just what to bring, but they told her what not to bring. No candles, no incense. Literally, they said, no fireworks, (laughs) no pets except fish. Why? Because Cal Poly knows that fireworks in a dorm room robs you of a healthy college experience. Do you want to know, and the Apostle Paul's getting at the same thing here, do you want to know the greatest influence in your life? Do you know who the greatest influence in your life is? You are. I am in my life. Why? Because we speak to ourselves more than anyone else does. People speak at a tone of about 140, 180 words a minute. I can get up to a gust of 300 words a minute when I'm really excited. But we think at a rate of 400 words a minute. I'm convinced that the root of joylessness is how we choose, how I choose to talk to myself. I actually confess more than often my internal dialogue betrays my identity. So Paul says, you know what? Set your roots deeply in the soil of God's word and let these be the boundary for what you dwell on. He's saying, speak God's word to yourself, what is true and admirable and lovely. I want to say this to us, PCC, if we're going to have joy. Don't believe everything you think. Not all the thoughts that come into your mind are healthy to dwell on. Speak to your thoughts instead of dwelling on them. Some thoughts that come in my mind, I hold up to uh, God's word and to the identity God says is true of me, and I tell on my thoughts sometimes. I'm like, God, look what it's coming to my mind. That's not the right thought, help me. That's what Paul's getting at, fix your thoughts. Then the second thing is this, rest in Christ's power. This is so important. Remember the power line illustration we opened with? 
we have a superpower within us. Look what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. Paul says, I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's a full stomach or an empty stomach, whether with plenty or with little. And here it is, friends. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Okay, raise your hand if you like change. My hand's down because I hate change. But our joy in life is largely tied to our ability to adapt to change because change happens. I was reading a blog this week called Responses to Why My Son is Crying. It's a great blog, Google it, Responses to Why My Son is Crying. Look at some of these pictures. Here's the first one. I wouldn't let him drink from an open bottle of Budweiser he found in a puddle. <laughs> Look at this crybaby. Robots don't have dads, and that's why he's crying. Look at this next one. This person's, this little kid's crying. The toast isn't square. This is my favorite. And this one's for my Gadini girls, okay? The girls on the floor. The guacamole's too cold. <laughs> you know, we laugh at that, at least I do. I see humor in it, but sometimes I wonder, if God looks at my whining, at your whining, and sometimes says, what babies? See, change happens, uh, and it's natural to whine. But what's supernatural is in verse 11. Paul says, I've actually learned something. Even the apostle Paul had to learn to grow in joy and in contentment. You know what that tells me? Joy doesn't come naturally. We're a lot like those babies in that blog. Friends, change is a part of life. It means growth. The only people aren't change, who aren't changing are dying. And God has given us this superpower to tap into, to replace the false security that we place our happiness in that we think gives us stability. Jesus is never ending. And Jesus says, trust me in the journey. You know, in Romans 15, 13, look at this. It says, may the God of hope Fill you with what? All joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, Romans 15, 13, overflowing with hope, filled with all joy. That is a brand of Christianity that people will be drawn to. Well, let me give you the third point. And this is so important. And it doesn't come from the book of Philippians. It actually comes from the book of Hebrews. But it's so important, stick with me. The third point is this, replace what's ultimate. Replace what's ultimate. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, one to two. This is so needed for our day. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. In other words, we don't get to choose the race when we come to Christ. He marks out the race for us. How do we do that? We fix our eyes, wait, wait, where have we seen that word fix before? Do you remember that? Remember that in Philippians? Fix your mind, repair what you think about. Here the author of Hebrews says, now fix your eyes. Repair what you're looking at. What are we to fix our eyes on? On Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Now look at this. We get a glimpse into Jesus' internal life, who for the joy his vision set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of God. See, we can be so easily distracted as followers of Christ. We can be consumed, it's just natural, by the tsunami of our current events. But herein lies the root of our problem. Hear me on this, okay? We're not setting the ultimate things before our eyes. We're consumed with the current as opposed to being consumed with the ultimate and giving a nod to the current. Let me ask you a question. What gets a pregnant woman through the inconvenience of pregnancy and the pain of childbirth? The ultimate thought of bringing life into the world. What gets a med student through the rigors of med school and residency and state boards 
the ultimate thought of that doctor living out her calling as a healer. What has gotten followers of Jesus in 2,000 years of history, even in the book of Acts, chapter 8, what got Stephen through getting stoned? The ultimate joy of the coming kingdom. And this, my friends, is what Jesus was fixated on through the crucifixion. I want to say something very gently and humbly, yet boldly, and this might sting a little bit, and I'm saying it to me too. PCC, what we're fixing and setting our eyes on is robbing us of joy. And like a tree branch pulling down our power line to the throne of God, it is robbing us of the radiance we were designed to live with. If the defining narrative of your COVID experience is binge watching Netflix, if the defining narrative of March and April was watching Lion King or, or Tiger King, whatever it's called, instead of fixating on the King of Kings, if right now your ultimate is CNN or Fox News or the presidential campaign, if right now you can only fix your eyes on Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat feeds or Facebook feeds, no wonder you don't have joy. Honestly, for Christ followers, why not utilize this COVID time and discipline ourselves with the power that Jesus gives to fix our eyes on the ultimate? We invite you into a G4 pathway to do this, to prioritize gathering and fixing your eyes on a worship experience. Get in a house church, it gets even better. To prioritize growing in, 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 a, in a circle, which are much better than rows, to deepen your relationship with Christ to fix your eyes on giving, serve. We need people to serve all over the place in our family ministries, in our ministries of compassion out in the community. Why not memorize scripture and fix your eyes there? Why not use your holy imagination, as C.S. Lewis called it, and think through your first five acts that you wanna do in the coming kingdom? Have you thought that? I actually have. I've got my first five acts. They have to do with a feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then I can't wait to reunite with my family and friends in Christ, even some PCCers who've gone before me. And then I wanna go on a horse ride with my daughters through Hutterd Park in the coming kingdom. And then I've got a run planned with Jesus in Sequoia Canyon. One of the most beautiful trails I've ever run is outside of Hume Lake. Can't wait to run that with Jesus. See, this is the thing we're called to be, keep before us as the ultimate. I, I, I want to see people that God has used my life to influence in the coming kingdom and hear the stories of how they've come to Christ. See, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That joy was the joy of the coming kingdom. What are you setting before yourself? And is it giving you joy? I love how author, theologian, pastor Tim Keller said it, the sin beneath all other sins is a lack of joy in Christ. So let's land the plane. Just some questions and application. This week, I invite you to take an inventory of your personal natural tendencies or methods of manufacturing counterfeit joy. Where are you reaching for, for joy and is it the counterfeit of happiness? Confess those, live free, confess those and experience the freedom of Jesus. Listen to the Holy Spirit and what he's saying to you and then embrace a habit to keep God's ultimate joy before you. As we close, I'm not gonna close in prayer, but with a benediction found in Jude, a New Testament book, chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 24 and 25. Receive this, put out your hands and receive this from me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, look at this, and with great joy to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Christ Jesus, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. While this gathering is wrapping up, you can take your next step with Jesus and with PCC. 
Text Jesus to the number on your screen for more information on what it means to have a relationship with Jesus or to talk to a pastor. To learn more about PCC, we invite you to please visit wearepcc.com and explore both the gather and the grow options to get familiar with the many ways to be in community with your PCC family throughout the week. Thanks for spending your morning with us. Now let's say our benediction together. May you jump into the arms of Jesus and may he push you out into the world and may you be healed as you participate in the healing of others, not because you must, but because you may. This is why we were born.